Wow. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to co-host with Jamie Fraser, uh, Mike Cohen. Um, a few minutes ago, Mike was joking that he was actually planning on surprising us and just showing up on campus here at UCSF. And I really wish he had done that because um, I've been trying to uh, arrange it so that he could come down and give a seminar here for a few years. And I thought for sure that uh, 2020 would be the year and then um, things kind of went haywire. And so it wasn't able to, to come to be. Um, and this would have been a good time, I think, but you know, when we were making these plans, it was things were up in the air with Omicron, et cetera. So uh, very psyched that Mike uh, is going to present his incredible science to us today. Um, so Mike was actually my first CCB student at UCSF. We've known each other for uh, 20 years, more than 20 years. Um, and um, suffice to say that Mike made a lot of, uh, what was successful in my lab happen. And so I'd just like to give a couple of quick anecdotes about uh, Mike's scientific trajectory uh, in the lab. And they both really center on paying close attention to chemistry uh, and, and geeking out on the chemical details. And so for Mike's first project, he came up with this idea of making a fluoromethyl ketone to target a cysteine and a kinase. At that time, that had never been done before. Uh, there were only a few examples of cysteine targeted kinase inhibitors and they all used acrylamides as the electrophiles. Um, and we had previously come up with the idea of using chloromethyl ketones instead of fluoromethyl ketones. And I told Mike that the fluoromethyl ketone would never work, that it just was too unreactive. And luckily he ignored me and he made this compound and it was brilliantly reactive and it turned out to be an incredibly potent and useful tool compound. So this is the first example where Mike ignored my advice about chemical reactivity. And then in the second example, which was right before he was about to leave, he came up with this other idea of essentially grafting super glue onto his inhibitor um, and using a cyanoacrylate um, and I said, that's way too reactive. That's never gonna work. You're just gonna decorate every single cysteine in the cell. And again, Mike ignored me because he was just really curious what happens when you put super glue on a kinase inhibitor. And it turned out to, again, have this beautiful Goldilocks principle that Mike is so capable of finding with his incredible curiosity. Um, and it turned out to be a very fast, reacting inhibitor, but also a very fast dissociating inhibitor. And so it turned out to have this remarkable and completely unforeseen reversible covalent activity that also generated several different projects in the lab. So in many ways, I owe the success of, of our work here in the Taunton lab uh, to Mike's pioneering efforts. Um, and especially the main message for students is that if you have a really cool idea, and your advisor says it's never going to work, then you should definitely do this idea and, and ignore your advisor. Um, so after a really successful PhD uh, in, in our lab, Mike went to do a postdoc in Sandy Jaffrey's lab, uh, really switching gears and becoming more of a neuroscientist. Um, and then he started his lab at OHSU up in Portland. Uh, where he's really become uh, an authority on the chemical biology of ADP ribosylases and developed all sorts of cool new methods, chemical genetic methods, new inhibitors, new tools for identifying substrates and ADP ribosylation sites, as well as exploring the biology of NAD nucleotides and derivatives more broadly. Um, and so I'm super excited. Mike, uh, I think recently got tenure. He's an associate professor at OHSU um, and he's gonna present uh, some of his exciting recent work. So thanks so much, Mike, for joining us and take it away. And thanks, thanks uh, Jack, and uh, for that really generous uh, introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I uh, really look back fondly on my time at, at UCSF. Uh, and thanks, Jamie, also for, for the invitation. Um, well, I'm excited today. To, 
sorry to interrupt. I, I oh, was yeah. asked to say one thing and I forgot to say it. Um, for questions, please write your questions in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to those uh, at the end of the talk. Sorry, cool. go ahead. No, no worries. Um, so uh, today I'm going to tell you about some of uh, the, the work going on in my lab. Uh, really, it's kind of centering on these chemistry-based strategies to, to explore NAD signaling and, and ADP ribosylation. Um, but I, would th I thought I would just start by um, putting up this. So this is, this is me as a graduate student um, in, in Jack's lab, uh, I think around 2005. Um, I don't know why I would look so serious, but anyway, this is, this is me. Um, and uh, this is really where I learned to fall in love uh, with chemistry and in particular chemical biology. Um, be, when I was a grad, when I was an undergrad, um, I had, hadn't really heard of it. And I think it was just sort of coming online anyway around that time, around 2000 when I was just getting started. And I had applied to all inorganic chemistry programs except one, which was UCSF. And I'm so glad that I made the choice to go there. Um, and so just one, I know there's some folks here in the, in the virtual audience that um, were there in the very beginning. And I just wanna say thank you for introducing me to this field, Jack and everyone else, all the other mentors I had. Um, and for those who are curious, this is, this is my family now, um, my wife and, and, and uh, three kids uh, in, in Portland. So um, as many of you uh, know and can appreciate, NAD is a molecule that's essential for knife life. Uh, it's this uh, dinucleotide. And when most uh, people think about NAD, they think about it in the context of redox biology, where it exists in this oxidized state, binds to oxidative reductases, and, and is reduced uh, to this uh, state over here, uh, NADH. Um, and this is, a, of course, a reversible reaction. However, it turns out that NAD is not only used in redox chemistry, but it's also used by what I'm going to sort of collectively refer to enzymes as NAD consumers. And all of these enzymes cleave the glycosidic bond of NAD, and they lead to a variety of different events in the cell. So the cleavage of this bond um, can lead actually to the generation of second messenger molecules where this uh, N1 position can actually cyclize back on here to make a, a cyclic molecule known as cyclic ADP ribose, and that's involved in calcium signal and it's also involved in post-translational modifications, for example, deacylation reactions that are mediated by a family of enzymes known as sirtuins, and ADP ribosylation uh, mediated by a family of enzymes known as PARPs, and we'll spend some time talking about those. Now, because of these NAD consumption pathways, there's a very important recycling pathway that takes this released nicotinamide and uh, recycles it back uh, in a salvage pathway to uh, produce more NAD. And in fact, if you inhibit uh, the rate limiting enzyme in this pathway, you see NAD levels uh, plummet in the cell, really demonstrating the importance of this recycling pathway and maintaining NAD levels in the cell. So my lab is generally interested in understanding uh, how fluctuations or changes in AD not only affect redox biology, but also how they affect the NAD consumers themselves and how the NAD consumers actually regulate NAD in the cell. And we're particularly interested in, in this uh, uh, pathway, the ADP ribosylation mediated by PARPs. And so over the last uh, 10 years or so, my lab has been developing uh, tools to study both NAD and, and PARP signaling. And I'll just briefly mention them here, and then we'll take a deeper dive into a couple of them. So um, uh, a few years ago now, uh, we were really interested in, in developing a strategy to actually measure free NAD uh, in the cell. And so we came up with this uh, biosensor in collaboration with uh, Dick Goodman's lab here at OHSU. And uh, this is based on a circular permitted protein. And I won't go into too much of the details, but suffice to say that this is uh, that the NAD binding site is actually based on the uh, NAD binding site from bacterial DNA ligase. And the idea is that when it binds NAD, we see a change in fluorescence. In this case, it goes from being fluorescent to being non-fluorescent. Um, and because it's genetically encoded, we can put it in different parts of the cell. And so we can monitor NAD both in the uh, like, for example, in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus, and we use that to actually determine the concentrations of NAD in different compartments and found that there is indeed this compartmentalization of, of NAD that's in part dependent on the NAD consumers like PARPs. We have a lot of uh, ongoing studies and collaborations uh, using this uh, sensor. Um, more recently, um, we've been really interested in kind of exploring kind of the, the NAD on beyond what is already known to bind to NAD, and I'll... Um, well, we'll get into this a little bit more later on. 
Um, a big part of my lab has been interested in developing strategies to identify the direct targets uh, of, of PARP enzymes in order to understand the biology. And then another part of my lab is really interested in developing uh, inhibitors of various PARP enzymes. So in the first part of my talk, I'll tell you about our efforts uh, on, a, on developing a strategy to identify the direct targets of PARPs and how we apply that to one particular PARP family member. And then the second part, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, this more recent work on uh, profiling the NED interactome. But before I get into that, I, I first just want to kind of go over some of the basic uh, uh, mechanisms of ADP ribosylation, sort of what we know. Uh, we know that ADP ribosylation is a major consumption pathway of NAD in the cell, and it involves the transfer of this ADP ribose unit from NAD onto a protein substrate. And we refer to this process as mono-ADP ribosylation or marylation. And actually, the, the, this, this reaction was first uh, identified as a major mechanism of a uh, pathogenic mechanism of a lot of toxins. And in fact, some of the early work in kind of understanding the mechanism of ADP ribosylation uh, by these toxins was done by uh, Norman Oppenheimer, who I uh, now know is retired but he was, uh, of course, at, at UCSF. Uh, and this is just one example of one paper that was published uh, in 1978, the year I was born. Uh, so he did like actually really important fundamental studies uh, on ADP ribosylation and NAD in general. And I had the privilege of actually spending time when I started my lab to talk with him for about an hour or so and just get his historical perspective on the field, which was super cool. Um, in, in, in mammalian cells, this initial ADP ribose unit uh, can be further elaborated to form a polymer of ADP ribose, and this reaction is known as poly-ADP ribosylation or, or parylation. And similar to other post-translational modifications that you might be more familiar with, like phosphorylation, these uh, reactions are reversible. So the polymer can be broken down by an enzyme, pr primarily by an enzyme known as PARGE or uh, that's a glycohydrolase. And uh, this uh, single unit of ADP ribose can be broken down by, by several different enzymes, can be re reversed, I should say, by several different enzymes. One example are, are known as macrodomain proteins. So what's, what I find particularly fascinating, uh, but also frustrating about ADP ribosylation is that the modification can occur on many different types of nucleophilic amino acids. Uh, initially, there was a lot of uh, studies done on glutamate and aspartate and, and arginines, and then more recent studies uh, showing that serine is actually a major site of ADP ribosylation, especially in the context of, of DNA damage. And what's also really quite interesting is that the enzymes that reverse the ribosylation seem to have amino acid specificity. So for example, uh, there are enzymes known as macroD1 and 2 uh, and TARG1 and viral macrodomains. They all share the same kind of general macrodomain fold. And all of these uh, have been shown to reverse uh, glutamate aspartate modifications, whereas this enzyme known as ARH1 based on a different fold uh, is able to reverse arginine, ADP ribosylation, and ARH3 most recently by Ivana Helen co-workers has been shown to reverse serine um, ADP ribosylation. So for many years, it was actually thought that there was just a single enzyme that catalyzes uh, ADP ribosylation or more specifically parlation in the cell. And that was the, uh, that enzyme is known as PARP1. Um, but it turns out that there's a whole family of enzymes, uh, 17, uh, that can catalyze ADP ribosylation in, in the cell. And for the most part, these enzymes contain the catalytic domain in the C uh, terminus. And so all these enzymes are, are called PARPs. Uh, yet only four of them have actually been shown biochemically to make uh, a polymer or, or, or catalyze this parlation reaction. That's PARP1, 2, and 5A and B, which are also known as tankerase 1 and 2. It turns out that the vast majority of these enzymes actually catalyze marylation, um, and, and uh, sometimes we refer to these as, as marylating PARPs. And so beyond the catalytic domain, uh, these PARP enzymes have many other uh, domains, uh, regulatory domains, for example, like zinc fingers that are involved in DNA binding and RNA binding, anchoring repeats like in the tank raises that are important, of course, in protein-protein interactions. Um, and of course, uh, these, uh, you know, this, this diversity of domain structures suggests that these are involved in many different pathways in the cell. And the little that we know about these PARPs uh, indeed verify that. But they also show and, and demonstrate the sort of complex regulation of these enzymes, both, both in terms of substrate targeting and perhaps sort of other types of allosteric regulation of these enzymes. M many, much of that is known about PARP1, and we're starting to learn about that for some of these other PARP family members. Um, and so 
uh, my lab, as I mentioned over the you know uh, uh, last several years, has been really interested in, in developing tools to understand the function of these PARP enzymes, both in normal physiology uh, and disease, and with a particular focus on the marylating PARPs, for which we don't really know much about. Um, and today, I'm going to focus in particular, at least in this first part of my talk, on, on PARP7, uh, which has emerged as a critical regulator of innate immune signaling, in particular nucleic acid sensor signaling, which I'm going to briefly talk about on this next uh, slide here. And so this is just a very sort of simplified or trimmed down version of, of the set of pl plasmic nucleic acid uh, sensor signaling. Um, and as many of you probably know, this is, of course, a critical uh, regulator of, of innate immunity. Um, and it's an important system uh, that recognizes pathogen derived nucleic acids in the cytoplasm and also nucleic acids that end up in this double stranded DNA that end up in the cytoplasm from the host um, from cell stress conditions, for example, like in DNA damage. And so there are a variety of different nucleic acid sensors that can recognize the cytoplasmic nucleic acids. Um, for example, uh, uh, Rig I uh, binds and recognizes double stranded RNA. Um, and uh, double-stranded DNA is recognized by another sensor known as C-gas, and when C-gas binds to double-stranded DNA, uh, it generates cyclic GMP, which is an agonist for sting. And in all cases, and, and there are other sensors that I'm not showing here, but in all cases, this leads to uh, a signaling cascade that ultimately leads to uh, the generation of, of type 1 uh, interferons. Um, and these uh, generation of type 1 interferons, like, like interferon beta, and that's really important for uh, the appropriate uh, systemic immune responses in, 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 in the cell and in the body. And dysfunction of these nucleic acid sensors can cause uh, a barren activation of, of immune responses. And so there are a variety of different ways that the cell has um, uh, uh, developed strategies to actually uh, repress or negatively regulate a lot of these uh, sensor pathways. And this is where PARP7 kind of fits in. And so PARP7 is also known as TI-PARP, and it's a marylating PARP enzyme that was discovered by Jason Matthews and Arlene uh, Rifkin's group and originally identified as a regulator of uh, AHR signaling or aerohydrocarbon receptor signaling uh, in uh, response to dioxin uh, poisoning. Um, but uh, recent studies by Jason's group in collaboration with Takaoa's group showed that uh, PARP7 is a, is a key regulator of, of nucleic acid sensor signaling. And what they found um, in the context of viral infection is that the, the loss of TI-PARP uh, or PARP7 um, leads to this enhancement of virus-induced uh, interferon beta production. And that's uh, shown here. And this is true for a variety of different uh, RNA viruses. Um, and then in the, if you look at the, in the context of nucleic acid sensor ligands that mimic these viruses, for example, these uh, rig I ligands like 3PRNA and poly I, uh, IC, you see again that the loss of PARP7 uh, leads to this enhancement uh, of interferon beta mRNA. And uh, in particular with the CGAMP, you see this uh, almost synergistic effect uh, in, in the production of, of uh, interferon beta mRNA. And so uh, these results show that the loss of PARP7, as I said, enhances this and would suggest that it's that PARP7 is, is uh, negatively repressing this uh, nucleic acid sensor pathway. Um, but of course, this just shows that the protein is important in this pathway, but what about catalytic activity? And in work that I'm not going to be able to tell you about today, we developed uh, an inhibitor uh, of PARP7, and what we showed is that this inhibitor phenocopies what you see in the, in the loss of function studies, where you see again, and this is looking at um, uh, 3PRNA, the Rigai ligand, where you see this uh, substantial increase in interferon beta production in, uh, in the uh, 3PRNA induced interferon beta production when you inhibit PARP7 catalytic activity. And this is also true for CGAMP. So all of this uh, together leads to the hypothesis that PARP7 suppresses the interferon production by marylation of specific proteins that actually regulate this nucleic acid sensor pathway. So in other words, the marylation that's mediated by PARP7 acts as a break that, that prevents uh, the type 1 interferon response. And in order to test this hypothesis and really understand the mechanism by which PARP7 marylation specifically regulates uh, nucleic acid sensor signaling, uh, we need to really identify the targets. And therein lies the challenge. So um, in, in many cells, and especially in the context of viral infection, many different PARP enzymes are actually expressed. And so because all of these PARP enzymes use the same substrate NAD, it's very difficult to link a particular PARP family member to a particular set of downstream targets because they all use the same substrate. 
And so really the, one of the major goals in the lab is to develop strategies where we can identify the direct targets of a particular family member. And in that way, begin to understand uh, how these PARPs actually regulate these pathways. We believe by identifying the substrates that will start to give clues into the biology that they're actually regulating. Um, and so to achieve this goal, we developed a chemical genetic strategy for identifying the direct targets of, of various PARP enzymes. And of course, this work was uh, inspired by the pioneering work of, of Kayvon Shokat, who developed this strategy originally um, for identifying the targets, uh, the direct targets of, of protein kinases. And it's been applied to other enzymes fa families, and we uh, applied it first to, uh, to the PARPs. And, and this is just showing the overall strategy here. The idea is that we start with a modified NED analog. And the analog is modified in two different ways. It contains this bump on the nicotinamide ring that prevents it from binding to wild type PARP enzymes. It also contains this latent alkyne affinity tag. Um, we then, uh, guided by structure uh, uh, and a little bit of luck, <laughs> we identified a mutant, a mutation of a particular amino acid in the PARP active site, uh, actually in the nicotinamide binding site, that confers sensitivity to this modified NAD analog. So now this mutant or engineered PARP enzyme can use this as a substrate to mediate marlation. So once this is transferred, it, of course, as I said, uh, it contains this alkyne tag that this alkyne tag can be coupled uh, to uh, a biotin azide using copper catalyzed uh, Huygens cyclization, commonly referred to as the click reaction to put on a biotin. And now the substrate is tagged, the, these substrate targets are tagged with biotin. We can then use biotin enrichment strategies followed by tandem mass spectrometry to actually identify the targets. And so we've applied this uh, methodology to a variety of different PARP enzymes. And by, by doing that, we've actually learned quite a bit about um, their function. I'm just giving you a few examples here. So we learned uh, about PARP 10 in autophagy and ubiquitin regulation, PARP 11 in nuclear pore regulation, and 14 in RNA stability and degradation. And I'm not going to talk about the details of, of how we uh, design the strategy, um, but all of that and, and some of the biology we learned can be found uh, in this recent re, uh, review that was written by a former student in the lab, uh, Kelsey Rodriguez. Um, so the work I'm going to tell you about on PARP7, all this work uh, was, was done by, by Kelsey, uh, who uh, left about a year ago to do a postdoc in Seth Rubin's lab at UC Santa Cruz. And, and Kelsey just was uh, just an, an amazing talent in the lab, and she did everything from the chemical synthesis of the molecules all the way to the cell biology and mass spec experiments. So initially, Kelsey synthesized uh, this uh, analog shown here. This is the 5-benzyl-6-alkyne NAD. This is one of our uh, clickable bumped NAD analogs. It contains this um, uh, benzyl group at the 5 position of the nicotinamide ring. That's the bump. And then the alkyne tag at this N6 position. So uh, the, the way that uh, uh, this experiment works is that Kelsey transfects uh, HK293 cells with the wild type PARP, uh, which serves as kind of the background control because it doesn't use this analog. And then the mutant PARP, uh, that is the, uh, in this particular case, it's the isoleucine glycine or IG uh, and uh, PARP7. She then prepares lysates that express these, these PARP enzymes and then performs the marylation reaction uh, in the lysates. Of course, it'd be great to do this in cells, but the analog is not permeable. Um, she then does click chemistry to click on uh, the biotin handle. And then what I'm going to show you next is, is a Western blot that probes for biotin. And wherever you see the biotin signal, that's uh, indicative of the marylation reaction. And so, um, when she did this, what she found is that we do see uh, a little bit of labeling uh, only in the condition um, with the uh, and lysates that express this Ig PARP7 mutant. So uh, it's demonstrating this this analog can be used as a substrate by PARP7, but as you can see, it's a very poor uh, substrate. And so we went back to the drawing board and asked, can we develop a better uh, substrate for PARP7? And so to do that, um, we initially looked at the structure of uh, this. Uh, non-hydrolyzable NAD analog bound to PARP1. We did the modeling uh, of this molecule bound to the active site of PARP7. And what we noticed is that the N6 position is pointed toward the pocket, whereas the C2 position on the adenosine is actually oriented out of the pocket into solvent. And so uh, what we first attempted to do uh, is just to essentially move the alkyne from the N6 position to the C2 position in hopes that um, there would be less steric clash and perhaps this would act as a better substrate. And we refer to this one as 5-benzyl-2-ethyl NAD. So Kelsey performed the same experiment uh, with these two different molecules uh, uh, and that I described a couple of slides ago to compare them, uh, uh, their ability to uh, label uh, PARP targets. 
PARP7 targets. And what she found uh, gratifyingly is that the 5-benzyl-2 ethanol analog was, was, was a much better substrate than the 5-benzyl-6-alkynin analog, and we got robust uh, labeling, uh, as shown here by the biotinylation signal across the molecular weight range. And so with that, we were uh, ready to go ahead and um, do uh, scale up and, and uh, from, for mass spectrometry. And so again, we used um, uh, neutravidin enrichment on B digestion, followed by a tandem mass spectrometry to actually identify the targets. So at the same time that we did this chemical genetic strategy, we also applied uh, another approach, um, a proteomics approach that's termed BioID. As many of you know, this is a proximity labeling approach that allows you to look at direct interactors of your protein of interest in cells. And we found in previous studies, with part 14, that if we combined this approach with our, bio, with our uh, chemical genetic approach, it really helped us focus in on the most interesting uh, physiologically relevant targets. So we applied the same strategy to part seven. And what we found is that when we use the um, uh, chemical genetic approach, uh, we found 250 total targets, uh, direct targets of PARP7, and the BioID approach uh, identified 189 uh, interactors. And we found uh, about 28 that, that overlapped. And it's not surprising that you wouldn't see a ton of overlap because, of course, not all of the interactors of PARP7 are going to be uh, direct targets of PARP7. And some of the targets we identify are in the, in the context of a lysate, and they may not be the most relevant targets in a cellular context. Um, and so if we then um, perform gene ontology analysis of, of the targets uh, that we identified, we saw a significant uh, enrichment uh, in terms that are related to uh, innate immunity and viral infection, as shown here. And that was uh, great because that was consistent with um, some of the previous literature that I had already uh, discussed earlier, uh, really validating this chemical genetic tar uh, approach to identifying targets that we think are relevant to the biology. Um, we also identified several terms that are related to sort of RNA regulation, um, uh, for example, RNA localization, translation of RNA metabolism, and that suggests that PARP7 might be important uh, in, in general and in, in various aspects of RNA regulation. And one of the, um, there were many targets that were quite interesting that we wanted to follow up on, but one of the ones that really kind of piqued our interest is this, uh, is another PARP family member, actually PARP13, and I'm going to tell you about that in the next slide. Um, so the reason why we focus in on that is because PARP13 actually uh, had been already established to play a critical role in antiviral immunity in many different contexts. PARP13 is also known as ZAP, and uh, it's, an, it's an RNA binding protein, as I mentioned, that uh, is antiviral in many contexts. Um, PARP13 comes in two uh, different varieties. PARP13.1 or ZAP-L and PARP13.2 or ZAP-S. And um, shown here is the domain architecture uh, of these proteins. PARP13.1 is constitutive and PARP13.2 or ZAP-S is, is induced by interferon. And both 13.1 and 13.2 contain this N-terminal zinc uh, finger uh, region uh, shown here. And this region is thought to be important for viral RNA binding. Uh, they also contain this WWU domain and, and this also this zinc finger uh, a single zinc finger uh, shown here, and recent uh, papers that are uh, were put on by our archive showed that this um, is important for actually binding to poly ADP ribose. Um, and 13.1 uh, also, in addition, um, contains this this inactive uh, PARP domain. So there are mutations in the in the active site that prevent uh, NAD binding, whereas the 13.2 is devoid of this catalytic domain. So um, for, for many years, it was actually thought that PARP13.1 uh, and, and point two actually play similar roles in the antiviral immune response. But recent work by Ram Savan uh, at uh, University of Washington and, and Matt Doherty uh, pictured here. And the reason I put his picture up is because Matt was actually a former uh, CCB student uh, who worked for Alan Frankel, he, came, he was a few years after me, um, published this really nice paper showing that 13.1 and 13.2 actually have distinct roles in the antiviral immune response. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but what I, what I wanna point out is that 13.1, uh, what Matt and his team showed is that 13.1 actually binds directly to viral RNA and sequesters it and leads to its degradation. Whereas PARP 13.2, actually uh, the induced form, binds to uh, interferon uh, mRNA, interferon beta mRNA, and actually suppresses its translation, and in this way suppresses interferon uh, beta production. 
And so the first thing that we wanted to do is to just validate that PARP 13 is indeed a marlation target of PARP 7. And so these experiments were uh, conducted uh, for the in vitro marlation assay by uh, a very talented graduate in the lab, Ivan Rodriguez Ciordia. So what uh, Ivan did is he expressed uh, GST uh, PARP7 uh, and, and Hisimo PARP13.2 in bacteria, and then perform this in vitro marylation assay where we use just native NAD, and then we can probe for ADP ribosylation using uh, ADP ribose antibodies that have recently uh, come online. And we've actually tried a whole bunch of different ones. And for those of you who are really interested in, uh, in, in exploring ADP ribosylation, please uh, let me know. And I'm happy to chat and tell you what, uh, what we've learned about those, those studies. And what, what uh, Yvonne found is that um, and it, that uh, PARP7 in vitro uh, is able to ADP ribosylate robustly PARP13.2 in a time-dependent manner, and that's shown here. Uh, PARP7 is also able to auto uh, marlate, and that's something that had already been known from previous literature and actually turns out to be true for many different um, PARP enzymes that they auto marlate. We also showed that this uh, is occurs uh, in cells. Um, so we expressed PARP7 alone or PARP7 with PARP13.2 and HEK293 cells. And we showed that PARP7 uh, is able to automarylate. And when 13.2 is present, is able to transmarylate PARP13.2. And to demonstrate that this uh, automarylation and this transmarylation is PARP7 dependent, we use an inhibitor uh, the, uh, of PARP7, and we see that with the inhibitor, we see a complete absence of the marylation. So taken together, these results show uh, that uh, indeed uh, PARP13.2 is a bona fide target of, of PARP7 marylation. And so now that once we had identified the target, uh, what we're really interested in is actually identifying the sites of marylation. And so for that, we actually uh, started a collaboration with Michael Nielsen's group, uh, in particular with Sarah Buch-Larsen, a postdoc in his lab at the University of Copenhagen. And, and Michael had spent um, um, the last several years really uh, optimizing a strategy to identify the sites of, of ADP ribosylation uh, in protein targets. Um, he's really become kind of the world expert in that. And the, the, the way that we did this experiment with Michael is to uh, express 13.2 alone in 293 cells, PARP7 alone, or PARP7 plus PARP13.2. Uh, we then shipped off the samples, uh, and Sarah processed the samples she lysed and trypsinized, and then enriched for ADP ribosylated proteins using a macrodomain enrichment strategy. And then the, the uh, mass spec method that they've optimized to actually identify the sites is known as electron transfer higher energy collision dissociation or ETHCD. Uh, and this is uh, very useful for identifying very labile uh, sites of very labile post-translational modifications. And then they searched for the pair of oscillation on essentially all potential nucleophilic amino acids. Um, and so when we look at the uh, one thing I, I be, just want to mention also is that in these studies um, we, where we overexpressing 13.2, uh, actually PARP 13.1, the constitutive form is also present uh, in these cells. And so when we look at 13, uh, PARP 13 labeling, we're looking at both the 13.2 uh, overexpression, the cases where it's overexpressed, and also PARP 13.1, the endogenous constitutive ex expressed. And what we find is that when we just express PARP 13, Point two alone, we actually see that the vast majority of ribosylation sites are on uh, serines. And if you look at the intensity, it's almost exclusively on, on serines. And this is really fascinating because the site that we actually identified on uh, two of the sites we identified on PARP 13.2 are uh, predicted to be PARP 1 or PARP 2 sites. And uh, there, there was no previous literature on, on PARP on 13.2 being a target of that. And so we're really interested in following up on those studies. And what was really striking is that when we expressed um, PARP7 in the cells, we actually found that the uh, all of the sites occurred, and this is now looking at endogenous 13.1, uh, occurred on cysteines. And that was really exciting to me um, because, um, as Jack kind of talked about in the very beginning, my, my work in his lab really focused on cysteine, uh, targeting cysteine covalent molecules. So I was really, and I've always loved cysteine, so I'm a cysteinophile. So it was great to kind of get back to cysteine and find that cysteine was the major site of ribosylation by PARP7. In the case of seven, uh, uh, PARP7 and PARP13.2 co-expression, um, we found that, uh, again, you know, many sites were on cysteines. Um, we did see some arginines as well, but if you look at the intensity, the vast majority of the sites uh, were actually on cysteines. And so all this together says that the major sites that are targeted uh, by PARP7 on 
on 13.1 and PARP 13.2 are in cysteines. So where are these cysteines? It turns out that the uh, majority of the cysteines that are targeted are actually the cysteines that uh, are participate in, in zinc binding. So all these cysteines in this uh, zinc finger here. And in one case, we did find a cysteine in, in the PARP domain, and in particular in the 13.1 variant. So there's a, a recent structure of just the N-terminal domain of, uh, of PARP 13 the N-terminal zinc finger domain. And what I've highlighted here in uh, cyan are all the cysteines that are that we identified as being uh, marlated in the mass spec experiments. Um, and again, you can see from the structure that most of these participate in zinc finger binding. And so um, what we wanted to do next is to validate the mass spec experiments. Um, and so we made various uh, mutations of these cysteines in the zinc finger. And um, uh, there's a lot going on here and just what I want to point out is that in this lane here, when we mutate all of the cysteines uh, in PARP 13.2 to uh, alanine and alanines, what we find is that we almost see a complete loss of the marylation of PARP 13.2, does not affect the automarylation of PARP 7, suggesting that the major sites of marylation on 13.2 actually are in these uh, uh, cysteines that are in the zinc finger region. And so just to summarize this first part of my talk, I, I told you about this chemical genetic strategy that we developed in the lab and how we applied it uh, to PARP7 to identify this, the, PARP, the targets of PARP7, many of which are involved in innate immune signaling. I'm really excited to follow up on those and to understand uh, their targeting and how targeting affects their function. I showed you that um, PARP13 is a major target of PARP7, and uh, the, the major site of, of marylation of PARP7 is, is on cysteines. And some of the future questions uh, that we want to ask, it, you know, what are the functions of cysteine marylation uh, on PARP13.2? As I mentioned, there are there's marylation that occurs on other amino acids, uh, serines, for example, mediated by PARP1 and 2. And one thing we're really interested in understanding is, is, is there a specific uh, function for marylation at a particular amino acid? And this is something that's not known in the field. Um, and when, what I worked on to tell you about um, we also found that beyond PARP13, the vast majority of, of seven targets are actually modified on cysteine. And with some of the questions that Yvonne is really interested in, in diving in deeper into or to understand how does PARP7 actually target cysteine uh, for ribosylation, and he's approaching that both from a structural uh, and a biophysical step point of view. Um, and also we want to know is, is, is cysteine uh, marylation reversible? Okay, so I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and just tell you about some um, recent work in the second part on, on profiling the NED interactome. And I, and I want to come back to a slide that I had kind of referenced early on, uh, just kind of introducing NED. And again, um, you know, just as a reminder, NAD is an important cofactor for azotoreductase enzymes that are involved in, in redox chemistry in the cell. And as we talked about with the PARPs and, and uh, other enzymes, it's also uh, involved, it's also used as a substrate by what I'm going to refer to as canonical NAD consumers. But what's really exciting is work over the last few years has I have identified um, non-canonical NAD consumers. And I'm just giving you two examples here, SARM1 uh, and, and SARM1, the NAD binding domain of SARM1 is this, is this TIR domain that's normally found in a lot of immune signaling proteins. And SARM1 plays a really important role in, in axon uh, degeneration. And actually, it's the executioner of axon uh, degeneration. There are a lot of interest in targeting SARM1 uh, in, uh, as a therapeutic. And then this other uh, protein, DTX3L, it's actually ubiquitin ligase and, and recent work um, by Dan Huang's lab uh, at Cambridge showed that DTX3L can actually bind NAD and transfer NAD to uh, ubiquitin. And what's really interesting about uh, these uh, non-canonical NAD consumers is that the NAD binding site is very different from the canonical NAD uh, consumers. Additionally, uh, there, if, if you kind of survey the literature kind of going back, you know, 20, 30 years, there were some ideas out there that NAD uh, and perhaps even NADH can actually act as al allosteric regulators uh, of enzymes, but not much work has been done on that. And so all of this together really motivated us to try to think about uh, perhaps unbiased strategies to really profile the NAD interactome, um, not only to uh, understand uh, the regulation of the NAD binding enzymes uh, that are known uh, or binding proteins that are known, but also the potential to discover new ones. 
And so for this, um, we sought to develop a chemical, uh, sorry, a, a chemoproteomic strategy for profiling um, the NAD interactome. And the basic idea that we had is to, uh, that we would start with uh, a clickable photo affinity labeling or a PAL NAD probe, and that's just schematized shown here. And the idea is that we would um, uh, append uh, an, NAD anal an, an NAD molecule with this, uh, what is often referred to as a, as a minimalist linker that contains both a, a, a diazerine as photo uh, affinity handle. Uh, shown here, and then also uh, this alkyne that can be used in, in a, uh, for click chemistry to click on a, uh, an affinity handle or a Tamara for visualization. And the basic idea, and some of you, of course, are very familiar with this type of chemistry, but I just briefly go over the idea is that um, we would use this molecule in a, in a cell lysate context. Uh, and then uh, after binding, we would um, irradiate the samples to 350 nanometer light, which would um, uh, activate this diazerine, releasing dinitrogen, generating a carbene that would then insert into proteins um, and form a covalent bond to the NAD tar binding target. And we, we then use click chemistry to click on uh, a, a biotin and then uh, uh, streptavidin enrichment and on bean digest followed by mass spec to actually identify the targets. So uh, this work that I'm going to tell you about is a, uh, was a collaborative effort between two uh, former uh, postdocs in the lab, uh, Justina Seletki and uh, Sunio Sundalam. Sunio is the uh, chemist extraordinaire, and Justina did all of the biology experiments. So it was a sort of perfect uh, collaboration between uh, two very talented postdocs in the lab. Um, the, the, Shown here is the structure uh, of, of NAD, and we decided to base our uh, PAL NAD probes on this molecule, uh, BAD, which I already kind of mentioned earlier on. And the only difference between BAD and NAD is that this uh, nitrogen in the nicotinamide ring is replaced with a carbon. And replacement of that nitrogen with a carbon prevents the hydrolysis of this glycosidic bond. And we thought that would be really important in this probe development um, to prevent uh, the hydrolysis of, uh, of this bond so that we are indeed uh, identifying targets that only bind to NAD and not the product ADP ribose. Um, and so we went ahead and so Sunil went ahead and he synthesized uh, two uh, different molecules um, where we put this uh, minimalist linker uh, containing the diazerine and the alkyne at two different positions on the molecule, but at the C2 position, which we found was actually better for PARP enzymes. And then also uh, the uh, N6 position, um, since we didn't know for other NAD binders how the modification would impact uh, uh, binding and recognition. Um, this was a heroic effort. Um, these molecules were quite challenging to synthesize, involved uh, multiple steps, I think, you know, about 20 steps from start to end, um, and just a testament to Sunil's incredible synthetic chemistry skills. So um, with these molecules in hand, Justina went ahead and we first um, did some just preliminary studies with, with PARPs um, because um, we had them in the lab and we, we have quite a bit of knowledge on that those PARPs. And we started with the two uh, uh, C2 modified analog that we refer to as uh, the 2-AD-BAD molecule because we knew that the C2 modifications were better for, for the PARPs. And just uh, schematized here is just the basic um, um, idea for the, um, for, the, for the experiment, that we incubate this, um, the 2AAD, BAD, uh, uh, PAL, NAD probe with uh, recombinantly expressed PARP10 in vitro. We then UV irradiated 350 to cross-link this molecule and then do click chemistry to click on, a, uh, in this case, a Tamara. And then we can use in-gel fluorescence to image. And what we found is that um, indeed this 2AD BAD molecule is uh, able to cross link to PARP10 in a UV uh, time dependent manner, as shown here, and uh, is also able to do so in a dose dependent uh, manner, show here, shown here. And we see very robust uh, labeling, even down to uh, uh, high nanomol or concentrations. So the next thing we wanted to do with this probe is we wanted to look at the labeling of, of PARP1. Um, in particular, we're interested in, in labeling uh, of, of PARP1 uh, um, in, in the context of, of DNA binding. And the reason why is because work, uh, really, really exciting work from John Pascal's lab at University of Montreal showed that actually PARP1, and I'm just kind of schematizing it shown here, um, that, and, and on this state right here is, is PARP1, what I refer to as kind of the inactive or PARP1 in the basal state. And what John found uh, in, 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 in a variety of biophysical studies uh, that 
he found that um, PARP1 is actually uh, that the NAD binding site of PARP1 is sterically occluded by this uh, helix that's known as the alpha F helix that comes from this uh, helical domain. And so this alpha F uh, helix actually sits on top of the NAD binding pocket, preventing NAD from actually binding. And when the DNA binding domains of, of PARP1 bind to this uh, nicked or uh, damaged DNA, there's a large scale allosteric rearrangement that actually causes a partial melting of this alpha F helix that uh, opens up uh, the, the NAD binding site and allows NAD to bind. And so this is a really cool example of this sort of allosteric regulation of, 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 of NAD uh, uh, active site binding. And so we really want to, to see if the, if the 2AD BAD probe could actually uh, uh, be used to monitor this type of um, allosteric uh, uh, regulation of NAD binding. And so what Gina, Justina did is um, she looked at uh, basically the same experiment that I described on the previous slide, except using PARP1, both in the absence and the presence of DNA. And what she found is that in the absence of DNA, we did not find any binding, uh, any uh, labeling of, of PARP1. But in the presence of DNA, uh, we found very robust labeling of PARP1 by 2 ADBAD. And so this is consistent with this model uh, that, and, and the same thing was not true for, for PARP10, which is not known to be regulated by, by uh, damaged DNA. And so uh, this, this, these data are consistent with this model uh, where um, the uh, binding of uh, NAD is occluded in the inactive state of, of PARP1, and that when uh, PARP1 binds to DNA, the uh, uh, NAD binding site is, is available and accessible uh, and can be labeled by the 2AD, BAD. And so this is really exciting because this uh, molecule now can be used as sort of an activity dependent probe of, of PARP1. And we're trying all kinds of interesting experiments actually in collaboration with John to explore this idea further. And one thing that we wanted to do um, just to push this a little bit more is to ask, okay, this is true for uh, this uh, NAD analog, BAD, but what about for a PARP inhibitor? Would the same thing be true? And so to address this, we just synthesized uh, a, um, uh, and a, a PARP inhibitor that contains this minimalist linker, again, this diazerine and, and alkyne probe. In this case, we used a laparib, uh, a known in, in inhibitor uh, of PARP1. In fact, some of the seminal discoveries, uh, discovery of this molecule and the seminal work of this molecule uh, was done by Alan Ashworth, who I know is here in, in the audience. Um, and this is a, the first approved uh, clinical PARP1 inhibitor. And so we made this molecule here and uh, asked, uh, does the, is the labeling uh, uh, of PARP1 dependent on DNA? And interesting, what we found is that actually the labeling of PARP1 uh, by this molecule was not dependent on DNA. Um, and so this really shows that the, that, that this kind of steric occlusion model doesn't prevent the binding of, of the, the inhibitors. And so these inhibitors are actually able to bind to this kind of inactive state um, but it does prevent the binding of the full uh, NAD molecule. And so we're really interested in using this to explore other PARP inhibitors. Is this true for all PARP inhibitors, only for a subset of PARP inhibitors? And I think this has really important implications for thinking about targeting uh, PARP1 in particular, and perhaps this might apply to other PARPs if they also are regulated by this allosteric mechanism. Um, and this is kind of an analogy can be drawn to uh, kinases uh, that bind, for example, to like type 1 inhibitors versus type, type 2 inhibitors. And so we're really excited to kind of explore this a bit further. Um, we, we can also use this molecule to do uh, activity-based kind of competition experiments. And I'm just showing you that for PARP1 and 2. Um, we used, um, in addition to BAD, uh, two different PARP inhibitors, this NMSP1118, which is a PARP1 selective inhibitor, and then ITK6, which is an inhibitor that we developed in the lab that's a, a potent PARP10 inhibitor that doesn't inhibit um, PARP1. What we found is that the NMS uh, P1118 compound is able to compete the binding of 2-ADBAD, whereas ITK6 does not. Uh, and in contrast, uh, the NMSP1118 does not compete uh, the binding of 2AB, 2-ADBAD to PARP10, but does compete, uh, but ATK6 does compete uh, the binding to PARP10. And all of this is consistent with um, our in vitro biochemical data. And so we think that this is going to be a nice uh, strategy to profile inhibitors across different PARP family members. And in this um, just last couple of slides, uh, I'll just tell you about um, 
how, how we use this probe to actually profile the NAD interactome. Um, we actually also use the 6AD probe as well. So we use both of these probes. And um, we did the experiment that I kind of described kind of um, a few slides back um, uh, in the lysates, incubating these two probes in, in a lysate to actually identify uh, NAD binders. Um, and what we found uh, in the streptavidin pull down is that 2AD BAD and 6AD BAD in a UV dependent manner were able to label uh, many different proteins uh, across the molecular weight range. And what was really interesting is that the labeling was actually diff quite different actually between the two different, different molecules, suggesting that indeed that this modification can impact um, binding to the NAD binding proteins, which is not surprising. We also used um, BAD in a, in a competition like experiment. Um, uh, to ensure that what we were ultimately looking at were molecules, uh, sorry, were proteins that were binding to NAD. And so that's kind of summarized here. So this is after filtering out um, things that didn't have um, a, a competition with the BAD, we identified um, with the 6AD, BAD, 38 uh, proteins um, that were competed by BAD. For, for the 6AD BAD compound and, and for the 2 BAD, we identified 26 proteins, 10 of which uh, overlapped. And if we uh, look at the proteins and, and in terms of their nucleotide binding, we found that about a third of them bound to uh, NAD or NAD related molecules. Um, another third or so uh, were previously known to bind to ATP or other nucleotides. And then uh, several others were actually not known to bind to uh, to NAD or related NAD molecules. So a lot of really cool um, proteins that we identified, potential NAD, NAD binders that we identified in this pr uh, initial proteomic study. And one of the ones that we've just followed up on is this adenylate kinase 1. Um, and adenylate kinase 1 uh, is an important metabolic enzyme that catalyzes the reversible transfer of the terminal phosphate group between uh, AMP and ATP, and it's just shown here. Uh, it plays an essential role in, in energy homeostasis and, and, and adenine uh, nucleotide metabolism. And so we wanted to uh, follow up our proteomic studies to confirm that indeed uh, adenylate kinase can actually bind NAD, and that's just shown here in this competition experiment where we used BAD, but also uh, NAD and NADH um, and, and related molecules like ADPR, ADP, and, and ATP, which are known ligands. And in all cases, we saw uh, competition uh, shown here. And this might suggest that, in fact, that the NAD is actually binding uh, perhaps in the nucleotide binding site. But of course, it's also possible that it's binding uh, to an allosteric uh, site as well. And that would still affect the orthosteric binding of ATP or AMP. We also did follow up thermal shift stabilization assays and found that uh, NAD and um, at, to, to some level, but NADH uh, uh, was actually better at um, binding to uh, AK1 actually and exhibited a similar th thermal shift to known ligands like ADP and ATP. And so all together, uh, this suggests that uh, AK1 uh, is, is a, a novel NAD, uh, uh, NAD, NADH binder. And so we're really interested in doing follow-up studies to, to look uh, at the function of, of uh, these NAD binding of these of NAD binding to AK1 function. So in the second part of the talk, I told you about uh, two, that uh, we identified these uh, PAL uh, NAD probes, uh, 2AD and, and 6AD BAD, so that the 2AD can be effective probe for PARP. Uh, for various PARP enzymes can be used in competition experiments and used as an activity-based probe. Um, and that both of these can be used in, in chemoproteomic type of experiments to identify uh, NAD binding proteins, both known and novel ones. And I showed you one example of that with AK1. And uh, some of the future directions of this project are to, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, to further characterize some of these NAD and NADH binding proteins that we identified in this chemoproteomics experiments. And then also to uh, use these molecules uh, for profiling the NAD interactome in uh, a variety of different um, uh, uh, disease states uh, and also in, in, in various tissues as well to, to understand perhaps the tissue uh, um, differences between uh, the NAD interactome and, and also the NAD interactome under different disease states. 
So with that, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, the members uh, of my lab, uh, shown here are the, the current members uh, of my lab. I talked about uh, some of the work by Yvonne uh, 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 Rodriguez, Yoria, and some of the work by some of the other lab members. Um, Kelsey Rodriguez, as I said, spearheaded all the chem genetic work on PARP7, and Justina and Sunil did all the work on the NAD probe. Um, I'd just like to thank our collaborators at the Proteomics Core, Larry David and uh, Michael Nielsen, our collaborators to the site mapping, uh, all of the funding to support this work. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Awesome. That Proteomics Core seems pretty, pretty, pretty good. So thank you. For enthusiasm for anybody who. Uh... And we have a couple of questions from. Uh... Norm Oppenheimer already in the Q&A and others can feel free to do that. I can't quite figure out how to unmute. Uh, so I will read them on, on his behalf. The first from Norm is, have you found any covalent modifications of the protein near the active site, e.g. acetylation? And I presumably this refers to the second half of your uh, talk. Is, so, um... Thank you so much, Norm, for attending. It's, it's really great. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Um, the um, so I, maybe you were talking about the first one with PARPs. I'm not sure, but um, with the PARPs, we actually haven't seen that um, acetylation in particular. But you bring up a really interesting question, and it is something that we've taken a deeper dive uh, into. Uh, in fact, we've been looking at a bunch of different data sets, some of which were generated by folks uh, at UCSF, like Evan Krogan. We've gone through those data sets and looking at phosphorylation mapping. We've actually identified some really interesting uh, phosphorylation sites that are right in the active site of some of these PARP enzymes. And so we think that uh, phosphorylation might actually be regulating some of the activity of these PARPs. And this is something that's completely unknown, in fact, for most of the PARPs and what actually regulates their activity. So this is something that we're actively pursuing. And then he also asks, have you looked for or found ornithine, ornithine, ornithine and proteins that are ADP ribosylate on ARC? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I know some of these kind of older studies from like Joel Moss and 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 colleagues. Um, and I, I don't think so. We actually haven't looked at that um, in, in any of our data sets. Um, you know, th this is for like a much longer discussion, but like I, we're not 100 percent sure um, about, you know, is the marlation that we see on arginines truly uh, a direct a result of direct transfer, or is it a consequence of generation of ADP ribose? Um, this is something that we're actually really interested in, in trying to suss out. And I kind of made a mention of this early on that this, you know, what is the real, what are the real sites of marlation, and what are ones that are a consequence of just generating perhaps these, you know, reactive intermediates? And this is something that we really need to work out. And then Davide uh, Ruggiero asks, or first says, great talk, and I agree. Uh, and he asks whether PARP7 marlates RNA during viral infection. And I'd just like to, you know, expand this to just in general, your thought of sort of RNA and nucleotide modifications and, and sort of how promiscuous these enzymes are. Yeah, this is a really uh, great question. Um, and so we, um, we, a couple of years ago, we, we published a paper with uh, Yvonne Ahel on looking at um, ribosylation of, of RNA. And we found that um, several PARP family members like PARP10, PARP11, and PARP15 are able to uh, marlate RNA. And interestingly, they actually marlate uh, RNA on either the five prime or the three prime phosphate. Um, this was using just a artificial RNA substrate um, and um, you know, there was not really much physi physiological significance to this was all in vitro, um, but we have thought about this for other PARPs. We haven't looked at that with PARP7. Um, I think this is something that, um, that we definitely are <laughs> actively looking at. Um, we don't, I don't have any data yet on it, um, but in just in general, this is something that we're really interested in exploring um, and something that you just brought up, Jamie, is, you know, what is, what are the sort of the relative modifications of protein versus RNA? And one thing that we uh, really need to get at, and I think it's a feel that we have to get to, is really understanding stoichiometry of the modification um, and and really doing sort of head-to-head -head comparisons of, of RNA modification and, and trying to identify you know conditions in which we might see 
modification of RNAs. Of course, some of you I'm sure are thinking that what about viral RNAs? And this is, so of course, something that we're looking at. And how does that compare to protein modification? Um, and so these are all great things and, and something that we're actively pursuing. And then another question in the queue from David Levy. What is the consequence of modification of ZAP for its antiviral or anti-interferon action? Yeah, th th thanks, David, for that question. That's a that's the million dollar question right now and something that we're trying to um, address. One of the things that we um, have noticed um, in our studies using inhibitors um, is that if you inhibit PARP7, um, the actual the levels of PARP7 go way up. Um, we know that the, that the RNA levels of seven are affected. Um, and that's interesting in and of itself. We actually know this is happening at, at a protein level as well. Um, and so one of the things that we're exploring is whether or not, it, it, let me just say also that this is true for PARP13. So when we express PARP7 with PARP13, we see actually see a lowering of PARP13 levels in the cell. And then when we inhibit PARP7, we increase PARP7 levels and we also increase PARP13 levels. And so one of the things we're interested in trying to understand is, is this uh, change in um, uh, stability of the protein related to the ribosylation itself. Um, and so that's one avenue we're exploring. We did do a, a little bit of work on looking at RNA binding, and we didn't see much effect uh, there. But of course, we did that uh, under uh, in vitro conditions where we know that we don't get very robust uh, modification uh, of 13. We get modification of 13, but it's not as robust as what we see in cells. And so we need to figure out a way to kind of purify the modified versus unmodified protein in a way to really do kind of these functional studies that, that you're suggesting. Okay. Um, Norm has another question. Fun talk. Can you <laughs> reduce the nicotinamide on some of your alkylating analogs? I ask because many NADH analogs can permeate cells. Yeah, this is um, a strategy that um, uh, that we actually proposed in, in, in one of the grants and that we're trying to go after. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're going to, you know, we sort of did this proof of concept first with NAD. Um, and, um, but with other, some other modifications on, on, on the sugar. Um, and it seems that that could be a viable strategy. Um, but one thing that we're wondering is whether if we made, for example, kind of what you're suggesting um, with our modified NAD analogs, if those would then be reduced in cells. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, you know, we know that probably obviously normal NAD will, or I'm sorry, oxidized, let me rephrase that, oxidized in cells. But we don't know if the modified NAD analogs, so having the modifications on the nicotinamide ring, if those molecules would actually be able to be oxidized in cells. Fantastic. I don't see any other questions in the, in the queue. It was fascinating. Uh, and, and really wonderful integration of so many cool new tools and, and compounds. So thank you very much, Mike. Jack, I don't know if you have any last words or last questions. I do, I have a question um, and I, I was trying to type it in, but I don't know, maybe as a host, we are not allowed to ask questions. So I'll just ask it verbally. Um, so kind of connecting both parts of the talk, this, this allosteric activation mechanism of PARP1 is fascinating. And I'm just wondering if you've ever using either your kind of clickable photo affinity probes or your substrate ID methods compared kind of stimulated versus non-stimulated cells in various ways. So for example, stimulated with, you know, agonists of the sting pathway versus control cells to see if you can actually tap into some level of regulation of activity. Yeah, that's so, that's such a great question. And it's something that we want to do. So this is one of the reasons why we're like, we've been trying to get these analogs into cells um, because this is this is one thing that, uh, that we want to look at. Um, we have explored um, basically trying to um, extend kind of the finding in the second part with the BAD molecule to inhibitors to see if we can find actually inhibitors that would report the active state, you know, versus ones that can basically bind to both states. 
Um, and we're getting closer to doing that, but on, at the same time, we're also trying to take our BAD molecule and make it membrane permeable so we can do exactly what you're uh, uh, suggesting and to look at the, at least for in the case of PARP1, but of course we want to explore this across other PARPs as well, um, because we do actually have some data support that um, some of the other PARP family members, and I didn't get a chance to really talk about this, but we're really interested in, in PARP6. We actually showed that PARP6 plays a role in the DNA in, in, um, in, in regulating dendritic morphology and neurons and uh, also identified mutations in, in PARP6 in, in human patients actually that have, um, uh, that, that have um, neurological defects. And so we're, we're kind of following up on a lot of that stuff. But um, what we think actually is going on is that PARP6, that the active site is occluded um, and that there's some sort of activation mechanism that's required. Um, and so, you know, is it neural activity? These are all things that we want to kind of go after. So there's a lot of cool stuff I think that we can do. We just got to get the molecules into cells. Great. Great. Well, everybody, please join me and Jack in thanking Mike for a fantastic seminar. And next time, hopefully you do just surprise us by, uh, <laughs> by showing up in person. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Mike. That was fantastic. Really great talk. And I'll um, I'll see you on the other side of the Zoom universe. Okay, or, cool. Or one-on-one. -on -one. All right. Bye. See Bye. you later. Bye.